Joy originally asked me to, uh, we thought the talk would be health literacy, past, present, and future. That sounded kind of boring. And so uh, I realized that what y'all were about is what the governor just said. What do you need to do? How do we work together to make people healthier and make the healthcare system more user friendly? And I'm, we're going to do a, a deeper dive on that today. So I'm curious about who you are. How many of you grew up in Alabama? Most of you. Okay. How many are you from small towns? How many are you from uh, Montgomery area? Birmingham area? Okay. Um, just like in getting a hold of who you are, how many of you are physicians? Okay, nurses, lots of nurses, patient educators, state employees. Who, what are the rest of y'all? Pharmacists. Pharmacists, okay. Pharmacists, PAs, social workers. Advocates. Okay, advocates. Okay, nonprofits, great. You got a Noah's Ark here. So. I'm in, I'm no, I'm from Louisiana, so I know about Alabama, so here's the real question. <laughs> okay, how many of y'all are Bama fans? Okay, how about Auburn? Okay, kind of mixed in here. So here's my disclosure, my funding, and since I've asked you personal questions, I grew up in Texas, I went to Emory, and I'm not a huge LSU Tiger fan, even though you know, people at people at LSU think Alabama. <laughs> of course, y'all keep winning, so that's part of the problem. <laughs> so, um, why should we focus on health literacy and patient-centered care? Well, to improve healthcare quality, safety, and to improve health. The bottom line. Patients, people must be more fully engaged, and we're going to talk today about what we need to do to more fully engage them. To successfully engage patients, we must shift from provider center to a patient-centered approach to communication and care. And what the governor was talking about, a lot of times, unintentionally, it's very provider-centered. Um, clinicians and researchers often fail to grasp the wide chasm that separates what we communicate and what people understand. And that's kind of the crux, one of the crutches of health literacy. Currently, only 12% of English-speaking American adults have proficient health literacy according to the only national health literacy survey. Um, Alabama ranks 50th in diabetes. 48th in infant mortality, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, 48th in overall health, 47th in preventable hospitalization, 46th in obesity and literacy, and 43rd in cancer deaths. Now, I know that seems bad, but I'm telling you, if you want to feel better, come to Louisiana. <laughs> We're like a tick worse. And we used to feel really good that there was always Mississippi, but Mississippi now is ranked higher than Louisiana. But the bottom line is the, the South must do something significantly different to improve these bad outcomes, and there's a lot of disparities underneath that. To improve health outcomes, reduce disparities, better manage cost, we need to help patients and their caregivers be more engaged in prevention, management, self-management of chronic disease, and safe use of medicine. Um, health information, it's not just information, it's our system it needs to be more user friendly. So our task is what are we going to do to make it more user friendly? Here's what the NIH says. We must not blame individuals for not understanding information that has not been made clear to them. And it's not just, I teach medical students and they learn a lot of words, but a lot of it is jargon. I'm not clear a lot about what financial people say, lawyers say, everybody has their own jargon and medicine is full of it. So health literacy is linked 
to health literacy is the capacity, it was defined in 2004, is the capacity to understand, obtain, understand, and use health information and services to make appropriate health decisions. Tons of evidence from research studies from the last 20 years have found low literacy is linked to people's ability to interpret labels and health messages, ability to take medicine appropriate, likelihood of receiving preventive care, delayed diagnosis, worse knowledge, confidence, and skills in managed chronic disease, understanding consent for procedures and studies, physical and mental health, ER use, hospitalizations, avoidable hospitalization. Right now, 20% of Medicare people are readmitted within 30 days. 34% are readmitted within 90 days. Some of that, we can do a better job. 70% of those people, after they're discharged home, have problems with medication safe use of medication, fear that they don't have the confidence, knowledge, and skills to handle it correctly. In 2004, the IOM came out with a report on health literacy, and that really began to move the needle. In 1993, there was the first national literacy survey. That survey said 90 million Americans, that's half of us, have low literacy. Then we begin to look at health literacy and how literacy impacts health. And what we realize is health literacy is not just literacy, it's uh, people with higher income, higher education can still have limited health literacy. Healthy people in 2010 and 2020 have an initiative of clear communication, plain language on all materials. The Department of Health came out with a National Health Literacy Action Plan to make health information and services easier to understand, more accessible, understandable, and actionable. And that is a good buzz word. To, if you think if our services and our information, is it accessible, is it understandable, and is it actionable? People are not writing a term paper on diabetes. They have to live with diabetes. So what is it they need to know and do? And then with the ACA or Obamacare and the Plain Language Act of 2010 put health literacy at the forefront of health care improvement. So y'all are beginning to do that in Louisiana. And PCORI, which is a new um, funding mechanism that came out of ACA, is really looking at patient-centered care. And patients must be involved in, and caregivers and providers every step of the way to make research more useful and not just sit on the bookshelf, but really be applied. So um, as I was saying a minute ago, the NIH said we can't blame individuals for not understanding information that's not been made clear to him. Everyone, no matter how educated, is at risk for misunderstanding health information if the issue is emotionally charged or complex. I can tell by the age of this crowd, everybody in here has had some health issues or had parents or children or grandparents with health issues. So this is not breaking news. In almost all cases, physicians and other providers try and believe we're communicating. Uh, and patients often think they've understood when they haven't understood it well enough. Um, healthcare organizations play a significant role in understanding. It's increasingly difficult, public health-wise, for what's on the internet and what's on TV for people to figure out what is accurate and what they need to do. Um, Understanding oh, how to select insurance plans and benefits. Everybody now has to know what a deductible and a copay is. People have to be insurance savvy. Increasingly, all you providers in the room, people with high deductibles are going to be asking you, or if they don't have insurance, how much does this cost? How much do these pills cost? Is there another treatment procedure test pill I can take that's cheaper? That's on the horizon. There's no transparency in the cost of health care now. It's like if I got on a plane and went to Los Angeles, I know exactly how much it cost and how much it cost on all the carriers. 
You go into the hospital, you have no idea how much anything costs. You get a bill that says this is not a bill, and then you start getting bills. And then you get a bill from the doctor, the hospital, the lab. The lab may be in another state. It's very confusing. So what is literacy? Well, it's more than reading. It's reading and writing. It's communicating. Basic math skills, so much of health care is math. And we're going to talk a little bit about math. If you think we have a problem with reading, we've got a real problem with math. Uh, also, unless you're a doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or an accountant, you don't use the math skills you had in school. You don't keep up with those. And so a lot of people are just quite frankly um, not very good at math. Uh, problem solving, judgment, and then there's going to be another national health literacy survey. And they're going to put internet skills on it. One of the things this demonstrates, during the Civil War, and I was jogging around Montgomery today, they're all monuments, there's y'all have so much history here, so much all kinds of history. But at any rate, during the Civil War, literacy meant that white men, who were the only ones that counted then, had to sign their name. By World War I, you had to have a third grade education. By World War II, you needed to have finished elementary school, sixth or seventh grade. The war on poverty, everybody was supposed to finish eighth grade. Now you can't get into the armed services unless you have finished high school or gotten a GED. And so increasingly, to get any kind of job, you've got to have internet skills. And increasingly, health care, everybody's got an electronic record, health record, but it's like patients are going to be increasingly checking on their portals or advised to do that or keying in information to their providers. So here you are. I don't know the um, geography <laughs> too well, sorry. Um, here's Montgomery. Y'all are yellow. There's a lot of red. Red counties mean that 30% or more of the people there on this national literacy survey scored on five levels was level one, which is approximately a fifth grade reading level. Those people are going to have trouble understanding labels on prescription pill bottles, over-the-counter medicine, all kinds of stuff we just assume people can read. So. What are some red flags for people that have low literacy? Um, most common is, I forgot my glasses, incomplete intake forms, frequently missed appointments. Everybody knew where you had to be this morning at 9 o'clock. You had written it down somewhere, electronically or on paper, and you had the problem-solving skills to get here. Um, the no-show rate at LSU is about 30%. 30%. Uh, unable to give a coherent sequential history, not taking medicines correctly, asking fewer questions. You have to have the vocabulary and the confidence to ask a question and lack of follow through with referrals. So these are common. I need to discuss it with my daughter. So these are patients that faculty from Emory and I interviewed uh, years ago, but the message is still very clear. And I want you to look at this and think, what are the lessons learned from these patients who have a variety of education levels, but they also have health literacy issues and show it's hard to be a patient? Well, I'm a kidney transplant. I've had the transplant for about 15 and a half years, but I've been sick forever. Okay. Well, I take uh, baby aspirin. That's something new. Cyclosporin. Prednisone. And when I make the doctor's appointments, I have to be sure that it doesn't interfere with his doctor's appointments, my doctor's appointments, or their doctor's appointment. So you don't like to go to the hospital where they give you a lot of papers to fill Paper, out? Papers, paperwork to fill out. Paperwork. Yes. Why is that? Because I can't read that good. Because you can't read that well. What does it feel like when somebody hands you a lot of paperwork and you can't read? I feel like you're in another um, country. Uh, Vitamin D, Nexium, Norvasc, Cholestid, Estratest. When you enter a doctor's office, the first thing, and you're first time patient there, they're going to give you a clipboard. 
sometimes that is very discouraging for a patient who cannot read. Lipitor, Paxil, Darvacet, vitamin E. If I'm really embarrassed or confused or worried about things around me or worried about my child being all upset, I would not be able to read things I normally would read every day. You know, some of the words that uh, Ms. Angie, Graham, Plasty, and all of that, what, is that several things or one thing? or It's just a language that I'm not familiar with. If the patient was transferred to that facility and to any and all insurance companies or other third parties paying or obligated to pay, this is... <laughs> This is not not making any sense. Tums, Tegretol, Tenormin, Sodium Bicarb, Cardera. Do you have any idea what a normal blood pressure is? No. Any idea? No. It's normal? No, it's not normal. It's high. Has, have you or anyone ever had to sign a consent form? Yes. I have hereby I don't know. <laughs> okay. Authorized. Authorized. My calcium spray, Nystatin, Aricept, Lasix, Ambien, Imodium when you need it, and uh, vitamin D. I believe that's it. So the people in this video teach me that you can't tell by looking at somebody what their literacy is. You can't tell necessarily by talking to them. Uh, and you don't know how confused they're all, they are until you have conversations with them and get you to teach back what they need to do and what they need to understand. And we're going to drill down on that a little more. One of the things I want to point out is medication error is the most common medical mistake. There are 1.5 million adverse events a year. Half of them are caused by patients unintentionally taking medicine incorrectly. An adverse event is not a mistake. An adverse event is a problem bad enough to bring you to the emergency room. So look at this. Two out of three patients leave the doctor's office with a prescription. It's big business. Just turn on your TV. There are jillions of ads increasingly for medicine. There were 4 billion retail prescriptions filled in 2014, and about a third of them are never filled. Now, I teach this to medical students, and I say, why don't I give you this little factoid? Because that is up 50 to 60% in 10 years. And I say, when you're out practicing, how many drugs do you think there will be on the market? People like me are over 65. They're taking more and more medicine. So who's on top of all of that? They, the more medicine you take, the more complicated it begins to be. Um, over 80% of adults take at least one medicine. The elderly, that's me, fill 20 prescriptions a year and see eight different doctors. That's why we need doctors like Cliff, who's a family doctor. One in six pediatric prescriptions are not dosed correctly. Over-the-counter prescriptions for pediatrics, you've got to figure in the kid's weight. It can be confusing. There are 300,000 over-the-counter medicines in the United States now. I mean, if you go into any drugstore or grocery store, the aisles are full of over-the-counter medicine. Very clever, colorful. Um, 600 contain acetaminophen, the main cause of liver failure here, the main cause of suicide in Europe. If you buy Tylenol in Europe, it comes in a blister pack. And so the FDA is concerned that we might need to do that. But most labels and inserts are in English only. Increasingly, our population is speaking other languages, particularly Spanish. Um, I love this study. It came out of Vanderbilt. And they gave people in a primary care clinic uh, sort of a little math literacy test health literacy test. You drink this whole bottle of soda. How many grams of total carbohydrate does it contain? Well, it contains 67.5. How'd y'all know that? You got two and a half serving size, 27. You did that in your head. Okay, let's see who these patients are. Three-fourths had private insurance. That tells me those people had a job. 
67% had at least some college. How far did you go in school? Well, I went to junior college. 80% read on the ninth grade level, but only over a third had math skills that were above ninth grade. So remember, Americans are not into math. So this uh, clip shows it's easy to make a mistake. So what you do, you come out of that, uh, that, that room, that examination room with this intelligent woman or man thinking, God, I hope I don't make a mistake with my medicine because I did not understand anything he or she said to me. When your children have fever, what do you usually give them? Uh, Motrin mm -hmm. or Tylenol. Normally Motrin because that's what my doctor recommended. How old is your daughter? She is four. Yes. She's four. Okay. Yes. I would um, give her the um, four to five, a, ta a tablespoon and a half. To so give her a tablespoon and a half. Can you find where it tells you how many you take? The dosage? Three a day? Take three to two milliliters. And there's something I want to point out. I don't actually read this because I know what it says now. So if I had to sound it out, if it wasn't for I knew it, because I've heard it so many times, I would not be able to read that. Okay. Every three to four hours as needed for pain. Okay. What's a milliliter? I don't know. The medication that was given to her was not explained. Well, we didn't use it. In fact, she ran out of her high blood pressure medicine. So she didn't take it. She didn't call me to tell me to fill it. So finally I found out that she had not been taking it. I said, Mother, you can't do that. You have to keep taking that high blood pressure medicine. When you get your prescription, you get all this stuff and mm -hmm. just throw it away because my eyes are not that good. And then it says discontinue. Yes. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> How many times do you take these thyroid pills? Once a day. Okay. Do you take one of each of these? Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. So you take two thyroid pills. No, I take one. Th I'm more like I got them messed up when I got refilled. And then, are these stickers helpful? Nope. Don't no. even look at them. Don't even look at them. Okay. And what do you take that medicine for? I don't know what it's for. Okay. He just puts me on stuff and he tells what I have. I just take it. This is typical of many of our patients. He just puts me on stuff. I think patients think because physicians prescribe it or it's over the counter that it's safe and they're not real clear about taking it. So we did some studies and we, I got dinged for doing studies only in Louisiana. They said it's because those people down there are so ignorant or whatever. And so we begin to do studies in many other states also. And this was almost 400 medicine patients, medicine clinic patients, and we gave them a prescription bottle, one at a time, and said, tell me how you take this medicine. And almost half didn't understand the instructions on at least one of the labels. And over a third with adequate literacy, they were reading above a ninth grade level, uh, missed at least one and almost nobody looked at the warning labels like do not drive and so I don't know exactly what this means um, are people being cavalier do they not read it accurately uh, what's going on that they're not taking it uh, and this is one at a time and many people are taking a lot of medicines and so then we said we filled uh, uh, red hots in one of the bottles and dosed them out and said, tell me how you would take this. Show me how you would take it. And so even if you had low literacy, about 70% would say, would I take two pills two times a day? But when we asked them to dose it out, they didn't dose out four pills. Uh, the female in the video said if she was the queen, no doctor would write the SIG two, two pills twice a day. For some reason, it's very confusing. We 
published this in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and the BBC picked this up and interviewed the man on the street in London. It was hysterical. They made the same mistakes, but they sounded real smart because they had a British accent. <laughs> so the other thing we're doing, and I challenge people in this room to do this, it's not rocket science. How do we make things more user-friendly? Nobody has changed the label in 50 years. We know now it's not working, so what can we do differently? So let me walk you through this. We are working on a label. We tested this out in FQHCs in Virginia with three panels. And this is what the patient needs. This is what the pharmacist and the doctor needs. And the software we were using wouldn't let us play around with the um, warning labels. But this is for Mike. It's his globuride. It's for his diabetes. Take two pills at breakfast, carriage return two pills at dinner. Then we have this little schematic. We at first drew little pills and people didn't know what they were. And so we put two and two. And we've tested it out with people with diabetes or hypertension in these 11 FQHCs. They were taking an average of five medicines and 39% had low literacy. What I want to tell you is the standard label at baseline without any counseling from the doctor, nurse, or pharmacist about 60% understood the standard label, but about three-fourths understood what I'm calling a patient-centered label. At three months, we checked adherence by counting the pills out. And it was 30% adherence with the standard label versus 49 with the patient-centered label. You know, there's no magic bullet, but there, there's stuff that we all can do to try to make things easier for people to understand and adhere to. So the information needs to be understandable and actionable. So Houston, do we have a problem? Much of the information we commonly give patients has little forethought into what's being asked of them. Uh, medical students know how to diagnose a patient by the time they get out of there, certainly by the end of residency. They know treatment options. But how you live with these things and embed them in your life, how to make it more user-friendly, they're they not there yet. We need to reduce the complexity, engage patients, enable them to do what we're asking them to do. And that's another one of the health literacy issues. Research is needed to determine what parts of the task are so complicated and redesign the task or support patients more effectively. And we can do this. We're just not doing it. Just like I learned when I started studying literacy, we can teach every child to read. We're just not doing it. So then the nurses in this audience might be interested in this. My husband had day surgery at a urology center. And before he was discharged, the nurses gave him an IQ test. Now, they had responded to the Joint Commission's Universal Precautions recommendations, and even though my husband was a mechanical engineer, they gave him this IQ test and teach back about how he was going to take his medicine. When we went back for a follow-up appointment with his physician, I praised the nurses to the physician. They had no clue the nurses were doing this. It was so state-of-the-art, quality health care, and the doctors were oblivioso to what was going on. So here's the IQ test. Uh, if your prescription reads, how you pronounce that, Cliff? Uh, whatever. One tablet a day. Would you take two tablets in the morning, two tablets at bedtime, one tablet in the morning, one tablet at bedtime? Anyway, they know that medicine is going to be the most common a uh, problem, and so they're giving you an IQ test on that and teaching back how well you understand what their instructions are, and then they call several times. So how do we improve patient-centered communication in clinic visits? We need to make the system easier. Make the setting welcoming, easier to navigate. You walk into a big tertiary care hospital, you're trying to navigate where you need to go. Clinical encounters, Sit down, slow down, avoid medical jargon, use living room language and include the caregiver if appropriate. Use pictures, teaching tools, pamphlets, brown bags, medical check, medicine check. Limit information. The more information providers give us, the more we forget immediately. 
So the, here's the deal. What is the need to know and what is the need to do? Uh, repeat and summarize. Teach back or show back to confirm understanding. I think increasingly we need navigators to Nurses are expensive, doctors are expensive, they have limited time. Somebody needs to be checking on a lot of these patients and it can be very cost saving. And also, as I said, cost transparency is, a part, is gonna be a part of the mix. So, is your environment welcoming? Are the signs easy to follow? Are check-in personnel calm and friendly? Are forms easy to read? Are they in Spanish, if you have Spanish speakers? Will a health coach or navigator aid patients, call, follow up? Increasingly, FQHCs have health coaches. What is their role? Is it standardized? What about the phone? Who answers the phone? Is it a computer? How hard is it to get the doctor on the phone? If you have a question at LSU about your medicine, you can't call the medicine clinic. If you have a question about birth control pills, you can't call the OB clinic. Who are you going to get? You see a different resident every time. And so the system is not user friendly. Um, so here's some common health literacy communication problems. Patients don't understand unfamiliar medical terms, even those with PhDs. Those with low literacy rarely ask for clarification or actively participate in decision making. They usually just nod their head. So in uh, transcripts of 150 genetic counseling sessions, the geneticist used jargon, the key jargon terms 20 times. She just kept saying it, but that didn't mean the people understood it. Um, patients with low literacy had difficulty recalling complex information. We need to make it simpler and less satisfied with the visit. So in 250 orthopedic patients at first post-op visit, less than half knew the bone they had fractured. 19% knew the expected, this is not a health literacy study. 19% knew expected healing time and less than half knew weight bearing status. Could be important. Surgery study, this was classic with 100 patients. 95% of the surgeons believed patients understood when to resume normal activities versus about half the patients. You know, one of the problems the patients have said uh, about resuming normal activities are do as much as you feel like. What if is there shared meaning and do as much as you feel like? Um, so I'm going back to math again. Percentages and probability are challenging. Half of you health adults can't calculate a tip. So look at this, 20% of college educated adults don't know what's higher, 1%, 5%, or 10%. U.S. adults scored below adults in 23 industrialized nations in numeracy and problem solving. So, and if you look at when your school system reports how they're doing, ours, the math is always worse than the reading. Um, risk communication is difficult. So we need to provide positive and negative frames. Six and 10 men who have the surgery will be impotent. Four in 10 will not be impotent. Um, give absolute rather than relative estimates. Drug X could reduce your risk of breast cancer by 50%. Sign me up. Well, drug X could reduce your risk from 4% to 2%. Are you willing to take this drug, which is a couple of thousand a month, um, maybe has side effects to reduce your risk from four to two? Um, a lot of people think uh, these kind of graphs are helpful in research that we've done. They found they were too busy and they didn't know where to focus. And so pie graphs were easier to explain um, risk and probability. The FDA is all over this. They, they don't know how we're going to exactly do this. I love this. This comes out of Johns Hopkins. What they say is strip it down, bring it home, mix it up, and have a normal conversation. So. Don't use jargon or complex language. Engage the patient in conversation that facilitates understanding, establishes rapport, and diminishes social distance. People want and need to trust their provider. And if they're gonna follow through with what the provider says, they need to really trust you. Uh, bring it home. Make health information personally relevant. Grounded in their day. 
And as one of the cancer doctors at LSU says, ask before you tell, before you just jump in, you need to ask what they know, what their experience is. Mix it up, cut the mini lectures, monologues, increase the back and forth, talk less, listen more. Check for understanding or you have no clue if they've understood. And you need their buy-in, they're the ones that have got to do it. Also, I don't know, especially when we're consenting patients, but also when we're treating patients, sometimes <laughs> we get this other voice. And it's like the more conversational and warm and friendly we can be, um, I think the better. So how do you limit information? As I said, tell me what's wrong. What do I need to do? And be sure to tell them the benefit because they've got a crazy cousin Nancy who's telling them something else. Also, in doing uh, focus groups with men who had heart attacks, many of them were discharged on a bunch of medicine. They hadn't been taking medicine before their heart attack. And um, the only medicine they'd really taken was an antibiotic. If you take an antibiotic, you feel better in a few days. If you take blood pressure medicine, you don't feel any different. You may feel worse. And they didn't take it the days they wanted to have sex. So I don't know if they mentioned that to their provider. But uh, <laughs> then if it's medicine, break it down for me. What's it for? When do I take it? Like, when during the day, two times a day? Do you take it at breakfast and dinner? Can you take it with food? Um, if you leave the doctor's office or a pediatrician's office at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and it's three times a day, do you wake the kid up? So people have these questions that doctors don't think about. Um, the benefit and the side effects. So pictures can be good teaching tools. You have uh, books that I'm going to talk about briefly on weight loss and diabetes. There's no measurement in here. No half cup, three cc's, whatever, because I got the message, we're not good at math. And so I've tested these out with Literacy Volunteers of America and said, what are we trying to teach here? They said, well, half your plate needs to be a salad or vegetables. And this is how much meat you can eat. This is how much potato. How much meat, steak? In Louisiana, we'd fill our whole plate with rice instead of this size, a teacup. But we try, people can remember visual. Visuals are so powerful. Visuals are so powerful. And so remember that when we're trying to educate people. So when you're using patient education materials, you need to ask, is the title Compelling. The American College of Physicians warned us to do a self-management guide on obesity. Well, that's not a compelling title. And so make it happen. Helpful ways to lose weight. And you can read the pictures. This is about families. The other thing, when we were making the diabetes book, we couldn't find stock photos of food in the right portion size. So we had to go to the grocery store, buy it, and cook it, and photograph it. Beans are hard to photograph. So. Um, the pictures tell the story in these books. Is the layout user-friendly? There's plenty of white space. The font is big. Key messages in all healthcare materials I've looked at, and I've looked at a jillion, the key messages are in there. They're usually just buried. So what is it you want the patient to know and do? Why is it in their best interest? Is the information actionable? What do you want them to do with it? Is it too much information? Is it culturally and language appropriate? So the other thing I want to tell you is dumb down. User friendly doesn't mean dumb down. Think about emails that you're getting. It's like, what do they want me to do? What do I need to know? Get to the point. Don't tell me all this other stuff. And so th these are instructions for an FODT fecal occult blood test, and these are simpler ones we developed. I mean, which one do you want to take in the bathroom with you? You know, you, you want to like, get to the point and do the test. Um, so people, even highly educated people, appreciate uh, simpler material. If they want more complex material, goodness knows there's plenty of it out there, uh, but they want the quick and dirty. The simpler, the better. This was a uh, I thought y'all might be interested in this. This was from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. They have templates for all their patient education. They're vetted with experts. They have a panel of patients who look at them. 
Every single thing where it's the name of the condition, disease, the medicine, the team, whatever, has this template with these colors, and these are pictures they have from a library of pictures. Uniform look, consistent message, makes development easier, easily re reproducible. Standard structure helps patients navigate the material. So they now can begin to look, these were trifolds, it's consistent. They know where to look for the information they need. It's familiar. So also, there are not too many researchers here, but a lot of standardized, validated questionnaires are not user friendly. They're too complex. People don't understand the question. They don't understand how to uh, answer the question. Likert scales, which on a scale of one to five with how frequently you do this or how intensely you feel about this are very hard for people. And so you got to be careful about the materials that you're using in research. And these guides were developed with LSU, UC San Francisco, and uh, UNC. And they're focused on the patient and not the disease. That's one difference. And they're focused on what they need to know and do. And we ask patients, nurses, doctors, dietitians, pharmacists, What's the need to know? What's the need to do? Now, if you have diabetes, you need to know a lot of things. But we focused on eating right, being active, checking your blood sugar, taking pictures, taking your medicines, keeping your feet healthy, and learning about insulin. And so it's very, even the table, of, it doesn't say table of contents. It says this guy will help you eat right, be active. The end of each chapter is a you can do it page color-coded, emphasizes small baby steps. So when we developed the guides, we did focus groups of patients all over the country. And they wanted information on how to manage diabetes, not why. And they wanted practical strategies for hunger, eating, and exercise. They were confused by portion sizes, food measurements, carbohydrates, keeping track of their blood sugar. Rarely called the doctor's office for help, didn't know the questions to ask often when they did. The doctors wanted to talk about how bad diabetes was, all the bad stuff that could happen if you had diabetes, associated health risks, the meaning of A1C. The governor was talking about A1C. Doctors love numbers. Um, the meaning of A1C tests, the importance of checking your blood sugar. Um, and younger physicians often use scare tactics, but fear is not effective in the long run. So is this a duck or a bunny? Who sees a duck? Who sees a bunny? Who sees both of them? OK, well, the deal is, duh, there's always a duck and a bunny. And so we in healthcare need to see the duck and the bunny, because if we're going duck, 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 and the patient's going bunny, 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 there's a misconnect. So what I teach medical students is the way to use the guide is briefly review it. So I say, read it before <laughs> you try to teach it. Then sell it to them. Go over it. This, I, have, I have something for you. This is going to help you with your diabetes. Ask them, though, before you get into that, is there anything that you are willing to do this week to improve your health? take better control of your diabetes, lose weight, whatever it is, so you ask. Now, I teach the medical students, sit there, because the patients aren't used to you asking. They're used to you telling. So they're going to look at you like deer in the headlights for a minute. Then they're going to say something like, my doctor says I need to lose 50 pounds or I need to lose 20 pounds. And then what you do is help them pull that down to something small, behavioral. That's, that's not a behavior, losing weight. That's an outcome. So what's the behavior? Walking around the block, not eating dessert, whatever. Assess their confidence, teach back to make sure you're on the same page and write it down, and set a time to call them, which is the navigation, the outreach. Ask them if you can call them, set a time that's convenient for them. So the action plan is I want to lose weight, plan decides to walk, around the block three times next week. It encourages their buy-in and teaches problem solving and increases their confidence. And this just shows you that when we first did this study, 
When we called them in two weeks, just about everybody had remembered their action plan. Three-fourths had sustained the behavior and added other behaviors, and the results were still pretty good at four weeks. Now, we also, and I was one joy to know this, this is something that y'all might be interested in Alabama. So we did this in Missouri at 11 federally qualified health centers. And we, we knew that maybe the health center wouldn't do it because it depended on an impassioned advocate. And so the health center gave the guidebook and then the counselor was based in Chicago because that's who had gotten the grant. And that person called them and went over the guide and established the action plan with them and called them at these touch points. Then at the end of the year, the people that had been called externally were more likely to remember the phone calls, set action plans, find the intervention helpful, they wanted to continue, and their A1C was better. So it was more effective, and we've just gotten a grant in Arkansas to do this in community clinics in Arkansas, and we're going to figure out, we've got health coaches in the clinics doing the calling, we didn't have to pay for that, and we're going to see how well it works and how often if we call them every two weeks, is that helpful or you get sick of somebody calling you every two weeks? So, here's the lessons learned. Plain language health information needs to be accessible, actionable, and developed with input from patients. Patients value trusting relationships with providers, appreciate genuine, caring, ongoing interest and support. Regular touch points, whether it's face-to-face -face or phone call or text now, uh, are important to people and their outcomes and their satisfaction. Involving family member is helpful to patients and providers, another set of ears. Action plan approach helps patients improve their health behavior, invites engagement, problem solving, empowerment, and improves outcomes. So, what's your path to action here? How does this stimulate your thinking and the coalition? Um, what can Alabama do to help patients improve their health, understanding, behavior, and management? What's an actionable plan to improve health care quality, cost, and outcomes? What's your action plan? What's the baby step? What's your goal? What research ideas or collaborations does it spark? So I hope this has been a deep dive into health literacy that you found useful and that you can take and move down your path. Thank you.